Uh, welcome everyone to today's NSC webinar. Um, as you can probably tell, I am not Sean, Mc Sean McVeigh. Um, my name is Lenore Basilis. I'm a soil scientist on the Technical Soil Services staff, and Sean asked me to be your host today um, for the webinar, An Ecosystem Perspective of Urban Soils for the S Sustainable City Era. This webinar is now being recorded, and all participants join the webinar in listen-only mode. You receive the webinar audio through your device to speakers. There is no telephone dial-in. If you are having audio difficulties, please check the various ways your computer speakers may be muted or have your volume set low, including the speaker adjustments available in the Adobe Connect interface. You can maxim maximize your webinar experience in Adobe Connect by shutting down VPNs and any other programs that might compete for bandwidth. This includes email and MS Outlook and instant messaging in Skype. Taking a look at our webinar room layout, Adobe Connect has content pods that include the, features, uh, the feature presentation, chat, and Q&A pods. Use the four arrow icon in the featured presentation pod to enter exit the full screen view as you choose. To submit a comment or question for me um, or our presenter, use the Q&A pod and type in your question. We'll handle technical difficulties the best we can while hosting the webinar and interact with our presenters to answer your questions during verbal Q&A period. I want to thank um, Maxine Levin uh, for being here today, and he will be introducing our presenter for our webinar. So Maxine, it's all yours. Thanks, Lenore. So um, I first want to uh, say that you know this will probably be the first of a series of uh, NSFC webinars um, that we'll be doing on the subject of urban soils and anthropogenic soils. Um, uh, just this last year, uh, the Soil Science Division of NRCS, uh, who the chairs are Randy Riddle in LA, and uh, Richard Shaw in New Jersey. And uh, the two of them and I worked on a book called Soils Within Cities, The Global Approaches to Their Sustainable uh, Management. And uh, with the International Union of Soil Scientists Working Group, SWEETMA. And uh, with that book, we opened up our eyes to a whole world of uh, ecosystem and ecologists and soil scientists all working with soils within cities. And uh, with that, we thought we would start uh, introducing and um, uh, bringing together some of the scientists around the country who are doing uh, urban soil research or related aspects of it. and. Um, and introduce them to you all, as well as uh, uh, introduce ourselves to some of the work that they're doing. So our first speaker in this series of uh, speakers is Dustin Herrmann. Uh, Herrmann with two R's and two N's. <laughs> I noticed that on our uh, flyer we had only one R. Um, Dustin is, a post is doing postdoctoral research at the Oak Ridge Institute for Science and Education in Cincinnati, Ohio, sponsored by the EPA. And uh, he has a PhD in ecology from the University of California, Davis, in Davis, California. Um, his dissertation at that time, which I think is interesting, it was a combination really of ag and urban in that he did the nitrogen retention in urban lawns. And his advisor was uh, Dr. Mary L. Candanasso. Candanasso. Uh, and earlier in 2008, um, in his career, he got a BS in biology from Illinois State University, Normal, Illinois. Um, so he's done uh, some research in the last eight years, as well as an adjunct professor of environmental science at Northern Kentucky University. And uh, the research that he's presenting today is associated with the work that he's been doing with uh, William D. Schuster uh, and Armand S. 
Gamma Stani at, at EPA. Um, so I'm really excited about this, and why don't you just go ahead and take it away, Justin? I will do that. Uh, thank you for having me. Uh, I'm excited to uh, present what we're doing. I do not have a uh, kind of classic soil science uh, training, but as an ecosystem ecologist, <clears throat> I've certainly been picking up a lot of perspectives, and uh, I'll try to share some of that and maybe a little bit of the road along the way. Um, so I, I am an urban ecologist, and I am uh, interested in these transformations to sustainable or urban sustainability. And so it's always interesting, what do you mean um, by sustainability? How do we define it? So I'll start with kind of how I uh, see sustainable city um, as the title uh, uh, lays out. And so there's a work by Stuart Pickett uh, that I think kind of sets up this pretty well. And my motivation is laid out in this statement here, the science of ecology, has contributions to make towards goals of urban sustainability through understanding and helping design and manage uh, existing and emerging cities. And so my interest in urban ecosystems and my interest in urban soils is kind of centered around uh, this goal of helping uh, cities and urban residents uh, transform towards sustainable. So I think a good place to understand the sustainable city is to think about kind of these city modes or city models as a, as a contrast from which to work from and the development of our cities, uh, evolution of our cities over time. So in the U.S. back in the 18th century, we just kind of had these mercantile settlements where we had, we were largely uh, a rural or agrarian um, uh, nation, and we had these little mercantile settlements that might have been centers for for trade or where craft people would uh, would use traded goods to make their own products. And urbanization didn't really kick into gear until we kind of hit this industrial city era as industrialization became uh, the driver of growth. This is our 19th century uh, city. Um, so uh, as economic boom, the industry was in cities, so it let a lot of the um, urban dwellers and the urban population grew. One noticeable thing is that um, there was lots of pollution and disease. We weren't necessarily good at making these healthy and desirable places to live. And so out of the industrial city, there was a, a response and, and to create a different kind of city um, than the one we were creating under industrialization. And so the 20th century American city in some ways has been, has been given the term um, sanitary city. So, Sanitary city, uh, and and I call it the 20th century uh, city mode, but this is kind of the dominant mode that we're currently in uh, here. These are the cities mostly as we know them. And the, the ideals is that we have this pollution, so we want and these undesirable living conditions. So the sanitary city came along in the 20th century. We wanted clean water. We wanted to get rid of our refuse. Um, we wanted to educate our children. We wanted to have places to re recreate. Um, uh, the ecology or the greenness uh, was mostly uh, with this uh, green space for um, for aesthetic and recreation value, um, and that was how how it was seen in the sanitary city. So thinking of the sanitary city as a, a, a good contrast for where we're coming from, and then it asked the question: So are we ready for a new uh, century of city? And will the 21st century American city be this uh, sustainable city. And so we are transforming from sanitary to potentially uh, sustainable cities. And so whereas the sanitary city really had a lot of top-down uh, management, we, the sustainable city, some of the big things are moving towards a lot more bottom-up management and using employing decision-making at this level. Um, in the sanitary city, we centralized a lot of infrastructures, whether it was water or sanitation. And the sustainable city starts to think about uh, decentralized infrastructure. And overall, where we uh, stamped out sanitary cities with using much of the same engineering techniques, um, a sustainable city is uh, vision tuned to, to the particular place, particular people, and, and cultures uh, that exist there and observes them and works with them. 
so here's a quick quick list. So it's always difficult, I think, to understand a sustainable city, and I think it's a, a good good way to understand it is to always contrast it with the city mode um, that we know, the sanitary city which we're coming from. So some of those things are moving from engineered solutions almost exclusively to these hybrid or um, complementary engineered and these ecological solutions. Um, instead of uh, the sanitary city segregated hazards, you have industry in one spot and you put residences in another, um, and that way you reduce the amount of exposure to safe pollution. Uh, the sustainable city is trying to uh, address and reduce hazards everywhere they exist instead of just moving people away. So the sanitary city did well to remove the waste. In the sustainable city, we think about having less waste to come in, cycling those wastes inside, or moving them on to other uses. We get a bit more integrated management um, in the sustainable city as opposed to these separated out uh, systems in the sanitary. And also, once you separate it out, you often get these specialties. So you get managed by experts. And now in the sustainable city, communities really start the people and the residents that are shaping the cities how they want this being in tune to place starts to matter more to get this expert and community uh, management collaborative. And we're also moving away from this kind of exclusive public dollars to, to operate the sanitary city to, to using both public and private um, uh, financial resources. And, and in line with that, in the sanitary city, you have the formal government that was responsible for a lot of the city services and other tasks. Uh, they were the main, the main actors. In the sustainable city, we still have uh, rules for formal government, but we start seeing a lot of uh, private, public, people type partnerships to, to do city the operation. So when I say um, an ecosystem perspective for the sustainable city era, it's really thinking about this, this general vision of what the sustainable city is and, and knowing that um, we have to have innovations and understanding to figure out how to make this, this type of city um, realized. So uh, let's see what I got. Ah, yeah, so here's just a quick uh, visualization. This is, this is uh, where I couch the work that I want to do, it is from the sanitary to the sustainable city, these transformations. In some ways, you think of that as moving from a gray uh, infrastructure approach to a green and gray complementary infrastructure approach, or brown, if you uh, like the soil term for, for green infrastructure. And uh, as, a, as an ecosystem ecologist, this transformation um, can be grounded in the idea of we're creating ecosystem services. These are um, the benefits that people realize from the, the ecological functioning. And some of these categories, you know, are provisioning, where you provide food or water or energy, uh, regulating such as carbon sequestration or, or regulating uh, the urban hydrology um, that can provide habitat for desirable species. Uh, it can also provide those cultural needs, such as uh, aesthetics and recreation or spiritual values. And one thing, of course, that uh, soil scientists are aware is that so many of these ecosystem services um, in cities fundamentally come back or, uh, or will be possible or constrained kind of by the, the, uh, the soil that, that supports all the ecological functions that occur occur in the system. And so I've come back to really thinking about um, that basis for, uh, for ecosystem services being in urban soils. And so we have a need really to understand urban soils to inform this transition to the sustainable city. And, and here is a, uh, this is just a general map. I'm not necessarily trying to show anything. It just shows a city laid, laid over a, uh, a soil map, it could be in this case. And, and this, is, this is true, we kind of have these natural soil states that are, are behind it, but in a lot of cases we don't actually have um, our, urban, our, our urbanized landscape 
don't necessarily have soil maps, or if they do, we know that there's a lot of transformations, and those, those transformations to the soil have a lot of uh, have a lot of heterogeneity. So if we have a soil map, we still don't necessarily understand um, our urban soil systems. And I know that there's been a lot of work pushing going on forward, and I'm not neglecting that. I think it just identifies that uh, that we know there's a lot of work to be done. Um, and it's a very tricky, very tricky task, very hard, which we'll kind of cover as I go through some of the work we're doing. So one thing is, uh, I'm a postdoc working there with uh, with Bill Schuster, and uh, he'd been really taking the lead on going out and doing doing an urban soil survey, uh, motivated a lot by an you know, the Clean Water Act uh, that the EPA works under to understand potentially how could these cities use uh, soils to manage their hydrology. But he went ahead and did some, some deep soil cores, um, took a consulting soil scientist, did full taxonomy on these cores, but also took uh, hydrology measures, some basic fertility and chemistry, and a few other details about it. Uh, using, the, in this case, to get the cores, they got a geoprobe. Um, and you can see it was uh, four to five meters in depth where, in some scenarios, so fairly deep uh, soil core that were taken. And so I present this. This is study is kind of the background of the data that we use for the, for the work we've been doing. And so the cities we went to, um, or I should say the bill went to, I did not get around and do all the hard work. Um, we're talking Seattle, Detroit, Cleveland, Portland, Maine, Camden, Cincinnati, even down in San Juan and Puerto Rico, Atlanta, New Orleans. Um, this other one here is Maduro and the Maduro and the Republic of the Marshall Islands, the South Pacific Island nation, uh, Phoenix and Omaha. There was an effort to kind of uh, make sure you hit cities that existed roughly inside different soil orders, so we captured um, captured as many soil orders as were possible. And then you see from these images, you can see kind of the, the, the white is where the sur soil survey um, is on, has, has it really unmapped um, as far as what soils are there, and then those dots represent some of the sites where we uh, where, where, where soil cut-ons were, were taken as part of the survey. So, yeah, pretty impressive, extensive urban urban soil survey that went on. So, when I think about, so the first, one of the first tasks with this postdoc was thinking about using this urban soil survey data and um, understanding the, their potential of these soils to support these ecosystem services. And one of the first couple places we looked in this paper was, was Cleveland and Detroit, where, which are having a lot, of, uh, a lot of depopulation over the last half century and are dealing with abandonment of buildings through, through the demolition of, uh, of, of abandoned structures. And so there's a lot of vacancy that is popping up on that landscape, and so this this new addition of urban land creates potential for some, some greater provision of ecosystem services. We wanted to assess what, what was the condition of those soils, and so we started with that look. And I have to say, up, up front, um, this was my first real glance into the size of these, these soil profiles, and um, it was very difficult to um, to apply some of the techniques that I might have used as an ecosystem ecologist, because the soils, while had many similarities, there were enough differences that at every point I had to step back and re-question my metrics and how I was thinking about them. But we'll get to uh, that, that frontier a little bit later in the talk. Let me first kind of show you the, the approach we took in, in this study here. Um, So we set it up as kind of took a series of landscape contrasts, asking, um, we're going to look at these soils, 
how they provide ecosystem services or potentially could, um, and, and what, what landscape contrast was important to differences in ecosystem services. Was the big differences between the two cities? Um, in this case, was it the variation that existed uh, among those parcels within a city? Or was it a variation, and I wrote between soil types here, how we, how we did that was at the parcel level, that image is meant to depict um, those soils within the building footprint um, where you had to have backfill um, during the demolition process, and, and those soils outside of that footprint, those, um, those that would have been less disturbed and in place potentially, say, in a residential landscape. Um, before it was demolished. So we we took these contrasts, try to understand them, and then we took a set of uh, ecosystem services. In this case, we looked at stormwater retention, uh, support for plant growth, and carbon storage. And then using the data that we had, we, we, we used different metrics as proxies for uh, the potential for these services. And I'm not, this is just a box plot to kind of show the distribution um, of those measures and what measures we use to evaluate it. There's a little bit more, more um, multivariate analysis and other analyses that are used uh, within the paper if you take a look at it. Uh, but you can see here you have your, uh, if you look at the box plots, uh, we measured infiltration and drainage rates for stormwater retention. And you have your, you know, your two cities, and then you have fill versus native, and I should say, in this case, I didn't end up using, we ended up using the word pre-existing instead of native in the paper, just as native meant to say that how it would have likely been on that lot before demo or something close to it, versus the, those spots that were actually the filled spots that were uh, basements or crawl spaces um, uh, previously. And then you can see kind of the range that existed as the variation that existed among those different um, uh, different parcels of land within each city, right? So, so the data inside here you can kind of see is depicting depicting all those things. And depending on what you looked at, um, you could see big variation um, between cities. This is particularly relevant um, to to say topsoil and to to infiltration. Um, you could see large variation just among the parcels that existed, those overlap the two cities. And then even within that parcel, um, fill and native or fill and pre-existing soils um, also offered some, some interesting patterns. I won't necessarily go into it here because I kind of want just this, this paper as a setup um, for learning based on where we're trying to go next, which is kind of an exciting direction. But one, one outcome we did find was um, you know, these are these are cities that have been urbanized, and then this kind of de-urbanizing process through demolition. But we did find this kind of this imprint of local geology and past soil formation that really mattered um, for what contemporary ecosystem services uh, were possible in those lots. So that history carried through and was really informing um, even processes right up to soil surface um, uh, that were going on. And then there's a couple other findings for for the other landscape contrast interest that I won't I won't get in too deep. And so this is just a cute. There's a tongue-in-cheek uh, um, uh, tourism uh, video for Cleveland, and uh, they're pretty proud to say they did not have as much uh, demolition and abandonment and otherwise <laughs> loss of their urban culture as Detroit. So the uh, the key takeaway from their tourism campaign was Cleveland were not Detroit. And so the same thing uh, in these ecosystem services. Cleveland was, was not Detroit. They are very unique in how these uh, urban soils look and how they would perform uh, as far as ecosystem function uh, and hydrology. So, so the, 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 the current activity is, is that we're doing with these soils, we've really been building up. I've been working with Bill the last couple of years and then thinking about what we can do with these and getting the database really lined up 
uh, to make it happen. And it's been a long iterative process, and I feel like we're at this point where I think it's going to be a really neat paper to come out or uh, later this year. And so what we're doing is we're taking all those cities um, and trying to get these general patterns in urban soil profiles. And, and the working title for this paper is the vertical geography uh, of urban soils. And I use the word geography because, uh, you know, it's, it's a spatial patterning and it's that soil science or soil formation that's in there, but then also these human processes. We have this mixed human and social science going on and then understanding really that spatial arrangement. And the reason as an ecosystem ecologist um, that I'm so fascinated um, with understanding this. So here I have, a, have an image of, of the first, sec, well, second edition of kind of our, our big textbook in terrestrial ecosystem ecology by Chapin et al. And in there, what you have, here's this statement that soils are arranged in a relatively predictable vertical structure. And we all know that classic soil profile, how it goes. And Ecosystem ecology uh, and our, our advances in understanding how ecosystem works and our building of theories um, explicitly or, or, or unacknowledged whenever we do it relies on this idea that there's this relatively predictable vertical structure and what that is. And we don't necessarily always, always bring it out and say, oh, hey, definitely we had uh, A and then B um, and then C, so that's what we got. But it's there. And so for, as I was doing this last study that I just uh, presented going through it, I was attempting to, to do proxies for ecosystem service. I looked at those profiles, and I was attempting to create, um, force them into this mold <laughs> of, of, of the standard, standard vertical structure. And I had struggled and I had to do a lot of changes and it really made, made me kind of open my eyes to, well, we don't necessarily have this relatively predictable vertical structure. It seems to matter for how we interpret it, whether we talk about storage of soil carbon or nutrient cycling um, or rooting depth. Um, however we want to think about it, it's, it's going to matter. And it's not that we have to throw it all out. It seems like there's probably um, a difference maybe slightly less predictable, but still predictable and understandable vertical structure. And so, so that's where we're going forward. And let me hit on a couple examples. We don't, this paper isn't, isn't fleshed out. Um, we will be presenting it um, at the Ecological Society of America conference in Portland, Oregon this August. Um, it's titled, it will be titled This Vertical Geography of Urban Soils. We'll have a probably a more complete presentation of it. Um, so you can follow it there, and hopefully it'll be out in the journal soon thereafter. Um, but let me tell you a little bit about the, more about the approach based in a more general understanding of how we, how we, we build knowledge of urban soils. And so there's kind of three different modes uh, for understanding soils, and, and this may be an incomplete list, but it's very general. So we have our classification and uh, mapping. And this classification can be what a lot of the work is, you know, like is um, understanding what new pieces do we need to add to be able to classify urban soils or anthropogenic soils. Um, and then do we need anthropogenic sequences that we can identify in creating those and then and so getting down to the very specific classifications and then attempting to, to map them. And of course, mapping is very hard in an urban environment if you have the open spaces where you can have access, you can really reconstruct it. But otherwise, we have a lot of chopped up um, private parcels and, and it's really hard to, to necessarily go back in and, and get a map. And there's so much heterogeneity. Um, have a, have a very complete map with, uh, with a lot of detail would, would, would be almost impossible. So jumping now to the other end of the spectrum, you have, you have kind of broad frameworks. So you move away from specific and we can understand urban soils broadly. 
I mean, we can think about the five soil forming factors as a real general framework and um, uh, Stuart Pickett and my advisor, uh, Mary Cadenato, put one out that uh, added a, a few factors to understanding urban soils in, in addition to that. Uh, you can think about the, the evolution of the, the urban soil pet on is another one. I think that's featured in the in the Sweetma book, or the Soils within Cities book that Maxine was talking about. And these are general, but they don't necessarily give us um, good specific information. And so kind of somewhere in this middle ground is the, the maybe these properties of urban soils. And I think a lot when I first read Philip uh, Crawl's work, um, and he was attempting to put it into the practice of landscape architecture and stuff, but an understanding of urban soils. And maybe we talked about some really general ones, um, whether it be compaction or loss of soil, organic matter, um, an inversion of layers, um, kind of general. And then in the last couple of decades, there's been an explosion, I think, in knowledge of surface soil properties, um, whether that's the distribution of heavy metals or organic matter. Um, we've started to understand a lot of urban soil properties, but not, not in a deep profile uh, kind of way. So where I situate this work is, is looking for a new frontier in, in, in urban soil properties uh, that really takes advantage of, of this vertical geography, this vertical spatial pattern, understanding it in that way. And it's led to um, thinking of new metrics um, and utilizing this data set and what new matrix emer metrics emerge that we can use to talk about um, an urban soil and something that is not specific necessarily to one place, but that is generalizable to, to urban soils. Um, so if we can do this, perhaps we can, can add some detail um, uh, where we can't get in and map, um, and essentially offer some ways to, to set up some new, some new research um, based on this understanding. So let me give a couple of examples after I um, set up uh, how, how we identify what's an urban soil property versus uh, a general soil property. So we have um, these urban soils from our study, and so we characterize the soil within an urbanized landscape, identify, uh, and then what we do is, and, and this is where actually Maxine and a lot of perhaps people on the call uh, have been in these talks, but we want to identify um, the soil series that would have existed in that spot had urbanization not occurred. Not like what soil series it's become, but what would have been there um, um, prior to urbanization. And so this is how we build a set of reference soils. Um, that, and this is our set of, of characterized soil patterns um, from a non-urbanized landscape, this ag or wildland. And then these reference soils come from the same soil series um, as the urban soil. So we go into that database, we look up those soil series, um, and we use those characterized ones to understand the changes that have happened um, in our soils. So here's an example of one we're working on. Um, Rich Shaw uh, helped us identify those reference, uh, you know, what soil series would have been there, so we'd have an understanding of which references to use. And so here's where in urban ecosystem ecology, um, we talk really about the homogenization or the simplification of the ecosystem in the urban environment. And so this is one soil property that really tries to get it at that. Are we seeing a simplification in, in the soil system in cumulative horizonization? So what you look at, here's an example for Camden. Um, what you have on the y-axis is your, your soil depth starting in stock with zero down to 200 centimeters. And then across the x-axis, this one through 10, um, that's the number of horizons that you hit. So as you go down and each A and B um, that you come across, it, it, it's, a, it's a new horizon, the amount of horizons that you reach. And so one thing that we're 
we're expecting to find, well, we predict we'll find, um, and that seems to bear out for Camden here. If you look, the, our urban soils are in red, and our reference soil series um, are in blue, and, and what you're getting is fewer horizons um, in these soils. They have uh, a, a simpler profile. There's not as many distinguishable uh, horizons that exist there. And, I, and there are a number of reasons that, that, that this can occur, whether it's mixing um, or just adding a fill on top and changing that all together. But what you're getting is a, much, is a, is a notably simpler um, the horizon. And so we'll, we'll, we'll play this out over the other, over, over the other cities and um, see if it goes on. So that's the uh, that's something where we look at really how does it change across depth, and I'll give I'll give one more example of a property that we're looking at um, uh, that kind of understands the pet on as as a unit as opposed to across its depth. And so one thing um, as soil scientists. Uh, you paint with a lot of colors and understanding any uh, any soil profile, and then as an ecosystem ecologist, I come in and, and I I lose a lot of those beautiful colors that you've added. And so this is an example of that where I've, I've simplified we've simplified that horizon that are in those urban soils. And it's just A, B, C, and we don't distinguish um, uh, different types of Bs or Cs. We just clump them all together. And we take this very coarse view of what that looks like. And the goal here is to start to, to, to pick out some, some spatial patterns that might be more difficult to pick out um, under a greater level of detail. And so I apologize. There's a lot of beautiful details that are, that are behind these that we've, we've picked out. And so here's an example of uh, uh, the Camden. You actually see that Camden has a lot of these AC um, type things, but what we've done is we've given them uh, a character, and that's what we want to know. Like we know urban soils are changed, just how different are they um, from from what you would expect? And so we call it, say, the distance from a classic A B C ordering to that that profile. So say you don't have that B and you just get an A C. That's you have a you have that's one transformation to the profile. Say that you have uh, uh, fill cap and the development of an A in that fill cap on top of the old ABC profile. There are a couple of changes in addition to that 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 uh, that soil profile. So just how different are they? And so what you get is on the x-axis here the number of changes to the profile, whereas zero would be you just have that ABC, and then one, two, or three changes. Um, and, and then in this case, here's the results, the number of pet-ons in, in our Camden survey uh, that fell into each one of these. And we're starting to get a look at, okay, where do you fall? In this place, it's a lot of zero and one changes. And then we also are creating a matrix so we can understand, okay, if you fall into these different number of changes, what, what are those changes most likely? Like in this case, we see if we get one change, um, in Camden, a lot of times, that is that is a loss of B and a movement to just um, this A to C. Um, and there's a few ways in which that could happen, but we're not necessarily um, characterizing the how, but just to see the resulting transformation to understand. So those are a couple of the examples I wanted to give um, about what we're doing there is identifying new soil properties, um, and particularly ones that might might matter for how we would set up uh, urban ecosystem studies, um, or, or maybe just a new, new, uh, a new way to think about how we characterize the urban soil environment. So, so that's what I have uh, as far as like the urban soil work. And the other thing that I'm working on with these guys is um, is shrinking city stuff. Um, I, I. I'm from the, the Great Lakes region, and if you're, if you're familiar, we have a lot of loss of population in those, those cities over a long period of time. And I talked about the vacant lot and some of those emerging things. 
And the idea that transformations to sustainable in a shrinking city um, might need to be a lot different than what it would be in a growing city or something um, something that has a little bit more economic activity that matches its size. So I'm going to jump through this last section really quick just to give you a sample of what we've been doing. And anybody who wants to talk and follow up on it, we can. But this kind of gets away um, from, from the soils work. So here's just an example of all those cities in the U.S. We've seen large population declines. Um, and here's just the dramatic picture of Detroit. You have parcels that are that have been demoed, and then you still have in blue the parcels with unoccupied structures that will, will be on the list of demos before long. And I also want to point out here, if you'll see it gray, there's still a lot of, uh, <laughs> it's not all vacant. There's still people at structures that are, that are there and being used. So you're, you're dealing with this kind of um, mixed environment. Um, I am an urban ecologist, so I work within the, the paradigms of urban ecology. But what I'm moving towards, uh, this is you move towards the bottom right, move a little bit away from the classic uh, research knowledge, um, re research um, down to this ecology for the city, which is a little bit more um, involving, you know, research and community. Um, is a little bit more designed to leverage uh, transformation. And so that's the that's the models that I've been working on, frameworks I've been working on developing. And one of those is this ecology for the shrinking city. And what's happened is we've lost a lot of the amenity value there in the bottom right, back when you know these, these neighborhoods were, were lived in. Um, and you get the, the loss of those amenities, whether they're jobs and, and people and, and, and other good parts of life. But we're starting to see this land replaced by, by with ecological value. But we haven't restored the, the desirable reasons why people for people in that landscape. And so an ecology for the shrinking city is, is a general framework for operationalizing, a general framework for understanding this, this need to transform, it, transform towards high ecosystem service and high amenity landscape uh, in these shrinking cities. I see my my line left an arrow on the end, but it's pointing towards um, where the kids are, where the kids are enjoying this landscape. But it's a general framework, and so one, this this is the direction I'm really wanting to go in is using these ideas of agroecology um, as a way to operationalize um, an ecology for the shrinking city, and I think it really works because it's already been many decades. Of, uh, of science and practice that has already been transdisciplinary, has been participatory with the communities and action-oriented towards, towards creating those outcomes with the community. But the other thing it is, it's a bit like Urban Ag 2.0. Um, we're getting a lot of land, and we can think more about a broader natural resource management uh, agenda. And the thing about agroecology is that it is geared, it has this aspect of, of serving kind of a smallholder and kind of a low capital operation on marginal land. What I think about in the shrinking city is that the, the, these lands are, are in this awkward matrix of existing urban uses um, intersected with roads and other infrastructures. And so it's not, doesn't lend itself to traditional production or industrial agriculture, uh, high capital ag. And as well as you have communities that are maybe both high unemployment or high poverty, and you also are seeking a community transformation. And so, um, so in some ways, this idea that it's about bringing food security and food sovereignty um, to these neighborhoods, as well as, as leveraging um, some, some livelihood options. And that, that paper is in review right now, um, Agroecology for the Shrinking City, a bit of a follow-up. But generally, it's operationalizing this ecology for the shrinking city. So it's the creation of and governance by the community members of a high amenity. And by amenity, I might mean with these pictures depicting livelihood, depicting uh, social cohesion, so relationships, and then also restoration of, of markets for, for goods um, within those communities. And then also using high ecosystem service land uses. So um, agroecological practices um, that, can, that can help with, with city level 
sustainability transformations. And yeah, that's that's all I have here. Uh, I just wanted to list off um, some of those publications that that are, that are associated with this talk that I went through. Um, and yeah, like I said, what's coming out here is the agroecology for the tree. So thank you again, Dustin, for your time and effort to make this presentation. And thanks to all participants for joining in. Uh, we had more than 55 people join today's webinar. The on-demand recording of this webinar will be available on our NSSC YouTube channel within a couple of days. So please feel free to let your colleagues know about this training opportunity. This concludes our webinar presentation.